coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents. The Bible says the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves will hear his voice. They that have done good, the resurrection of life. They that have done evil, resurrection of damnation. The Bible speaks of two separate resurrections. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Millennium of Prophecy video series. Biblically, there are two kinds of dead people the saved and the lost, okay? Jesus said, if you're not with me, you're against me. The Bible says, the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves will hear his voice. They that have done good, the resurrection of life. They that have done evil, resurrection of damnation. The Bible speaks of two separate resurrections. Who is in the first resurrection? First Thessalonians, first Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 tells us, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, wherever you've got the number first, it's a sequential number. Somewhere you've got what? The second. If you want to know when the second resurrection is, you jump to Revelation chapter 20. It says, blessed is the one who's part of the first resurrection. The rest of the dead, who would that be? If the dead in Christ and the righteous rise first, who are the rest of the dead? The lost, the wicked. It says, the rest of the dead do not live until the thousand years are finished. So that's the second resurrection. You want to make sure that you're in the first resurrection. Am I right? Number eight. At this point, what happens to the living in resurrected saints? Answer. The dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Those of us who are alive and remain, and I believe there are many of you here who will not die of old age. You know what I'm saying? They won't die. There's going to be a time of trouble, and some may die. And there's going to be some persecution. We'll talk about that. But I think that we are living in the generation that will witness the second coming. Do you realize that many of us, some who are here, some who are watching, you have the privilege of doing what Enoch and Elijah did, of being translated without ever tasting death, of dropping off this mortal carnal body and putting on your glorious eternal body. Won't that be nice? Be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and God is going to do that in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We'll be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and then this mortal will put on immortality. Right now, we've got these mortal suits that we're wearing. Where am I now? Number nine. After being changed, what happens to the righteous? Those that are alive, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. That's what the rapture means. We are caught up together with them, the resurrected saints in the cloud. See, friends, when Jesus comes and the dead in Christ rise, we're going to go to heaven together in a grand, glorious procession. You know, there's all these comics and cartoons about Peter guarding the gates, and he's got his computer, and he checks people in one at a time like a hotel clerk. You know, that's not the picture in the Bible. The picture in the Bible is a grand, glorious, brilliant procession where we together go back to that city of God. Amen. That's going to be wonderful, friends. Number 10. Now, I want to spend a little time on this because it's often misunderstood. What solemn warning does Jesus give about his second coming? Answer, Matthew 24, verse 5. For many shall come in my name. Now, does he say a few? Many means many. Many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Few is the minority, many is the majority. That tells us the majority will be deceived. Now notice, it says, they'll come in my name, saying I am Christ, and deceive many. That scripture can be understood two different ways. First of all, there are a lot of religious leaders that come in the name of Jesus. They say, I come representing Jesus. They're not saying they are Jesus. They come in his name, but then they deceive people. You got that? So that's one way you've got these false representatives. Then, of course, you've got the kooks who say, I am Jesus, right? And, you know, and it's really sad. Uh, this is Jim Jones, of course, who started out, he used to go to church, and, and uh, he was involved with the Methodist church, which is a good church, preached, and, and uh, 
But then something happened, and he started wanting to branch out on his own, and, and pretty soon he got away from the Bible. I baptized the young lady that was in Guyana. She left just before the congressman came down, and they all committed suicide, and they killed the congressman. I went to the place where he had his office. You know, we're from Northern California, the People's Temple in Redwood City. A tragedy. Hundreds of people believed he was the Messiah. They killed themselves. This girl that I baptized, she said the Lord saved her just in the nick of time from that situation. He started out. We all trusted him. He read the Bible. She said by the time they got down to South America, the Bible was in the outhouse, and they used the pages. Well, I'll leave it to your imagination. He had to get the Bible away from the people. He said, it's the old book because he knew the Bible was exposing him as a false Christ. And that's one thing that often happens with these false teachers. They start out claiming to use the Bible to get believers and then they, they uh, wean the people away, away from the Word of God and say, you now trust me, I have fresh information. The Bible's the old letter. Friends, I tell you, the Word of God does not change. A lot of false Christ. Matthew 24, 24 and verse 26, for there shall arise it false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. Now, if somebody appears claiming to be Jesus and they look like Jesus and they're very nice and they quote the Bible and they're doing signs and wonders and miracles, how are you going to know that it's not Jesus? I'll tell you one very simple litmus test you can apply. The Bible tells us when the Lord comes back next time his feet don't touch the ground, we are caught up to meet him. So any character walking around on this terrain saying, I'm Jesus, you, be, you need to watch out for. If they manage to come with 10,000 times 10,000 angels, then you would think that maybe this is Jesus, right? But if they're coming down again next time, he said, I already came down on your level. Next time you're coming up to my level, right? He came down to us once. He said, next time we go up to where he is. He came quietly. Next time he's not coming like a lamb, he's coming like a lion, right? So if somebody's walking around saying, yes, I'm Jesus. Oh, and incidentally, I met one once. <laughs> now, I told you I used to live up in a cave. And later this week, I'll give you the whole story of my testimony. I've got some pictures you'll enjoy. Right after I read my Bible up in the cave and I accepted Jesus, I was a baby Christian. I had a lot of things mixed up. I did not know the Bible like I know it today. I knew a little bit because, you know, all I did up there was read the Bible. I lived like a hermit for a year and a half. And uh, one day into my cave yard, such as it was, this gentleman came hiking. I used to run into hikers every now and then. And he had you know, green eyes and shoulder-length chestnut hair, beard, mustache, uh, olive skin. He was about six feet tall and high. Hello, how are you? He came and he sat down to catch his breath a little bit and introduced himself to me. He said his name was uh, Michael David Harper. And he said, that's my earthly name. But I, in fact, am Jesus. Well, that really sent my emotions spinning because, first of all, I thought, I'm up here in the mountains alone with this lunatic. <laughs> Secondly, I thought, well, he does kind of look like the pictures I've seen. <laughs> if it is Jesus, I don't want to insult him and call him a nut. That'd be the worst thing in the world you could do, right? And so, you know, I'm just being honest. These are the things that were going through the mind. I thought, and if he is Jesus, I've got a lot of questions. But my first question was, I said, well, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but uh, the Bible says that you're coming with the angels and there's going to be a shout and it's going to be, he said, that's when I come generally for everybody. He says, but I'm coming quietly for certain select few first. The guy knew his Bible, you know, and he was quoting scripture back to me. And, and at first it really had me unnerved. But after he stayed with me for about three days and ate all my food and didn't help clean up at all, I knew Jesus wouldn't do that. Eventually I had to evict Jesus from my cave. He was really a slob too. And then I ran into him in town and he had managed to find an apostle. There was this tall, skinny hippie following him down the streets in Palm Springs saying, this is Jesus. He found a believer. I felt much more relieved a few days later when I saw him again and he was missing one of his teeth because he got drunk and got into a fight and they knocked one of his teeth out. And I knew, I knew that Jesus has all his teeth, right? We all know that. And so then I knew it couldn't be Christ. But those aren't the ones that worry me. The ones that worry me is when Satan 
and his representatives impersonate Christ because it will be very convincing and it says they will do great signs and wonders so that if it's possible the very elect might be deceived but what's going to keep us from being deceived coming to this seminar finding out what the Bible really says when did I miss the second part of uh, number 10 okay let's get Matthew 24 verse uh, the rest of that there it says here in as much that if it were possible they should deceive the very elect if they say unto you behold he's in secret chambers believe it not you know we had David Koresh and Jim Jones and the leader here of Heaven's Gate they were waiting for a comet to stop and pick them all up and they drank a lethal potion and they even got the group in, another group in Canada and Switzerland these cults and I'll tell you friends there's no shortage of uh, deranged and dangerous religions out there am I right yes. Jesus makes sense his religion will save you not kill you he came to keep you alive he wants you to use your head he does not want you to follow blindly are you aware of that that's why we're operating this seminar this way God says in Isaiah come now let us reason together God gave you a brain he wants you to think for yourself I don't want anybody following me I am already intimidated that my kids are starting to act like me that frightens me I don't need any disciples following me I'll be grateful if I can make disciples for Christ amen, amen. and so I want to point you to God and to his word number 11 what will prevent the righteous from being deceived what's going to keep us straight Isaiah 8 verse 20 according to the law and the testimony if they speak not according to the Bible this word this is the law and the prophets the law and the testimony the new and the Old Testaments the Word of God that's how we're going to measure whether or not they are genuine or counterfeit and incidentally you know of course that if you're going to make a counterfeit bill you don't make a four and a half dollar bill you're not going to pass that off to be counterfeit you want it to resemble the genuine as closely as possible Satan has been preparing his final act for 6,000 years now and don't underestimate him that's why you are going to have to go by the Word of God and not by your senses not by what you hear not by what you feel so many people say oh but it feels so good if what you feel is in conflict with what the Word of God teaches what are you gonna follow the word, the word of God is the only safe thing when Jesus was in the wilderness hungry and the devil said you can turn these stones and the stones probably looked like loaves of bread out there on the sand you can turn them into bread he felt like doing it but he didn't go with his feelings he said it is written you know how this world got into the mess we're in because when Eve looked at the forbidden fruit she said it it smelled good it was desirable and it appealed to her but God said in his word do not eat it she went by her feelings and her senses rather than the Word of God and that's how we all got into this mess number 12 would it be safe to even just go see a false Christ if he's meeting at a stadium somewhere someday and you say well I'm not gonna believe I just want to check it out is that safe you're venturing on enchanted ground when you do that and it is very dangerous don't try to engage the devil it says in Matthew chapter 24 verse 26 therefore if they say unto you behold he's in the desert go not forth you do not even want to go and look it's not safe number 13 what can we know about the time of Jesus return answer Matthew 24 verse 36 but of that day and that hour knoweth no man anytime somebody comes up to you and they say look I've got it all calculated there's a radio preacher and several others have tried to pinpoint it and they experience massive embarrassment don't try and pinpoint a day or hour because no man knows that but can we know when it's imminent when it's close yes Matthew 24 verse 33 Jesus tells us when ye therefore shall see all these things know that it is near even at the doors can we know when it's close yes is it going to be a secret no and that brings us to our next question number 14 soon there's going to be a trip the Lord is going to make through the galaxies there's heavenly preparation being made right now 
And all the world is going to know when it happens. And our question number 14, what will the angels do at Jesus' second coming? Matthew 24, verse 31, his angels shall gather together his elect from one end of heaven to the other. He's got his people all around the world. Do you see that? Isn't that what it's saying? From the four corners of the earth. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this before we, we move on. There is going to be a time of trouble before the Lord comes back. There's been a lot of speculation. Does this great tribulation take place before the second coming? Does the second coming take place in the middle of the great tribulation? Or does the second coming take place after the great tribulation? And there are a lot of good Christians that believe what they call pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. These are churchy words they use to describe when is the tribulation in relation to the second coming. I believe very clearly that the Bible teaches that the tribulation takes place before the Lord comes. A lot of dear people think that what's going to happen is that uh, they'll be walking down the streets or w driving a car or flying a plane and bingo, they're going to all disappear and uh, life's going to go on here on earth and then the tribulation comes. But the Bible tells us that God saves his people not from tribulation, but through tribulation. Let me give you some examples. When the seven last plagues come in Revelation, it's an echo of what happened to the children of Israel in the Old Testament when the ten plagues fell on the Egyptians. Were the children of Israel in Egypt when the plagues fell? Yes. Did God save them through the plagues? Yes. Did God save Job from his trials or through his trials? Did God save Daniel from the lion's den or did he save him through that experience? Did God save Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, the fiery furnace? Did he save them from that? Or did they go into it and he went through it with them, right? Amen. God saves his people through tribulation. Paul in the New Testament says in the book of Acts, it is through tribulation we enter the kingdom of God. This idea that the Lord is going to take us away before the going gets tough is not biblical because the church is the light of the world. We will shine the brightest when the world is in the most abject darkness. He's not taking us out. The Bible says you will be hated of all nations, Matthew 24, for my name's sake. Jesus said, he that endures unto the end. Endures what? There's going to be a great tribulation. That's why he says you've got to build on a rock because the storm is coming so your house doesn't fall down. He doesn't say it's a mobile home. He's going to take you away before the storm comes. We're going to be here for the tribulation. Now, a lot of very dear people believe that after the rapture, life goes on here on earth for another seven years because Jesus is coming as a thief. People are going to say, he came and we missed it. Open your Bibles. I've been quoting scripture, but I'm going to turn you now to 2 Peter chapter 3. I think we'll start with verse 10. Uh, we're going to talk about how the Lord comes as a thief. 2 Peter chapter 3. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which... Now, some people stop right there. He's coming as a thief, Doug, and that means that it's going to be a big surprise. Nobody's going to know, and life will go on the next day. You tell me if it looks like life goes on as normal after Jesus comes as a thief. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with a fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we be in all holy conversation and godliness, right? Looking for the day of God whereon the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Does it sound like life as usual after Jesus comes? No, friends. I think the idea that the rapture takes place and then life goes on is a very dangerous belief because some people think they've got another seven years during the tribulation to get their act together. That is a dangerous doctrine. And incidentally, I'm believing the safe thing. I'm going to brace myself for the tribulation before Jesus comes. If I'm wrong, I'm still ready. But there's a lot of people, as Peter says, who are going to be amazed at the fiery trials that try their faith as though some strange thing happened unto them. They're going to go, what's this? We thought that he loved us too much to let us suffer, that he was going to take us out of the world. Did the apostles of Jesus suffer tribulation? 
I'd like to tell you otherwise, friends, it's a very fanciful, appealing doctrine to say that he's going to take you away, but the Bible says he's coming for a church without spot, without wrinkle, and you know you get the spots and you get the wrinkles out with an iron, cold iron or a hot one. And you can, hot water, to, oh, Karen's reminding me, you get blood out with cold water, but the other spots you get out with hot water. And that's how we get the clothes clean. What question, in a, number 15. Since we are living just before Jesus' second coming, how should we relate to the solemn and glorious event? Answer, Matthew 24, verse 44. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man comes. You know, friends, I like that word be. God said, let there be light, and there was light. When God says be anything, that means he gives you the power to do what he's saying. When he says be ready, you ought to be very happy. He said be ready. That means he can help you be ready. When God said to the leper, be cleansed, he was cleansed. And so when the Lord is telling us to be holy, you can be holy. When he says be ready, you can be ready. Because most of the world will not be ready. They're going to wait until it hits them as an overwhelming surprise. Number 16, how will people be rewarded at Jesus' second coming? Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Now, wait a second, Pastor Doug. I thought we were saved by grace through faith. We are saved by grace. But the Bible's very clear that your behavior is in the judgment. We are judged by our works. Your works demonstrate whether your heart has been saved, whether you've been changed. If a person says, Lord, Lord, and they don't listen to him, Jesus said they're liars. And so they'll be rewarded according to their works. Number 17, what will the wicked say when Jesus returns? Now, this is a long one, so stay with me. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bond man and every free man, they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Who shall be able to stand? I'm glad that the Lord is going to give us the power to stand through that time. Number 18, what will the righteous say when Jesus appears? Isaiah 25, verse 9, they'll say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he might, he could, he may, he will save us. That's good news. And we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Number 19, what is the prime reason that Jesus is coming the second time? He's coming to get even with those who persecuted him, to teach them a lesson. What does the Bible say? Some people think that God's vindictive that way. Answer, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, you may be also. Amen. He's coming to receive us. Now, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. You know, the language the Lord is using there is the language of a wedding. Back in Bible times when the groom proposed and the lady accepted, he went back to his father's house and he built a honeymoon chamber. And do you think that after he built the honeymoon chamber, he stands there and he stares at it and he says, now, I know I built this and I can't remember what for. I'm supposed to pick somebody up. Who is it? He says, I've gone to prepare a place for you. In my father's house are many honeymoon chambers. You think he's going to forget the bride, the church, his people? No. Did he come the first time like he promised? Yes. That was 2,000 years ago. I trust he's going to come again just like he promised. And I want to be ready, friends. I want to live forever, don't you? Amen. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. How about you? I want to get out of this world and go to a place where there's no more sin or suffering or sorrow, and it's not a fable, it's real. God has a real paradise. It's amazing to me we got all these people who believe in Star Trek. They don't believe that God can make a city, right? It's a matter with us. Do you want to be ready for that day? The main reason is for him to come back for you, and I hope that it's your desire to be ready. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after these important messages. Now, are you aware the devil has some advantages over God? In the battle between good and evil, God can only use truth. 
The devil can use any combination of truth or error. A lot of the world is deceived about the devil. And you know, the devil is so rotten. He will tell you to do something wrong, and then he will turn you in for doing it. Journey back through time to the center of the universe. Discover how a perfect angel transformed into Satan, the arch-villain, the birth of evil, a rebellion in heaven, a mutiny that moved to earth. Behold the creation of a beautiful new planet and the first humans. Witness the temptation in evil. Discover God's amazing plan to save his children. This is a story that involves every life on earth. Every life. The Cosmic Conflict. If God is good, if God is all-powerful, if God is love, then what went wrong? Available now on DVD. If you've missed any of our Amazing Facts programs, visit our website at amazingfacts.org. There you'll find an archive of all our television and radio programs, including Amazing Facts Presents. One location, so many possibilities. Amazingfacts.org. Friends, the Bible tells us that we have a spectacular homecoming to look forward to in the very near future. The scriptures clearly describe an awesome, earth-shaking event as Jesus returns to take his people home. For the saved, it'll be the most joyous occasion imaginable. For others, it will be terrifying. That's why God wants you to be ready for the day of the Lord. Yet there are many confusing and counterfeit teachings regarding how Jesus is coming. You can learn the truth about this phenomenal event in a book that we prepared for you. It's entitled, Ready or Not. You won't want to miss out on what this book reveals regarding what is really going to happen when Jesus returns. We'll send this amazing book to you for a donation of $20 or more. Please call the toll-free number on your screen and ask for offer number 1002. Or go to our website, it's amazingfacts.org. If you prefer, you can write us, Amazing Facts, offer 1002, P.O. Box 1058, Roseville, California, 95678. Well, time is up for this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Until we meet again, remember, Jesus is the truth that will set you free. This is your opportunity to take advantage of this week's special offer. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. You may also visit our website at amazingfacts.org. Thank you for watching Amazing Facts Presents.